And also, uh, to protect your privacy, all participants and attendees have had uh, their videos turned off and have been muted, and chat functionality at this point in time has been turned off. A few other notes. This is a consultant-led open house, and it is not a statutory public meeting. Um, and this meeting will be conducted by project consultants and is being facilitated by city staff. We just have a few notes about technology troubleshooting at the start. Sometimes technology troubles do happen. Uh, we do have a list of common technology issues you may encounter on getinvolved.cityofkingston.ca on our Get Involved platform. If your audio and video isn't working for any reason, we do have a few uh, options here for you on the board. So you can adjust your view options to make sure that you can see the screen properly. Uh, you can also rejoin using the link that is listed on this slide here. I'll give you a moment just to jot that down. If you're unable to join via the web link there, you can go ahead and call in at the number that's no noted sorry, on that screen. Please make a note of the webinar ID below that. You will need that if you're planning to call in. And if that isn't happening or working for you, uh, feel free to follow along on the city's YouTube page. Again, this is being live streamed as it goes on, but once completed will be a video which can be watched at any point in time after that. Following a presentation by the project team, there will be an opportunity for attendees to ask questions and share comments. So we have two ways of doing this through the Zoom platform. You can ask a question writing by typing one in the Q&A. Uh, you see a little uh, image at the bottom that kind of shows you where you can find the Q&A on your taskbar. Simply click that, it will bring up a window and you can type your questions in there. Project staff will be uh, monitoring that and will be able to answer your questions. And to clarify, consultants will be monitoring and responding to questions and can type responses as well. You can also ask a question verbally during the Q&A by raising your hand. If you raise a hand, I will acknowledge it. And uh, when the moment comes along, you will have an opportunity to unmute yourself, ask your question. After your question, you will be immediately muted again. And again, consultants will be able to answer your question. We just uh, want to specifically remind you that the chat feature and Q&A are separate. The Q&A organizes all of the questions that are coming in, whereas if it goes into the chat, it may be missed. So please ensure that you're using the Q&A when you'd like to ask questions. We'll keep an eye on the chat, uh, but we don't just want to make sure that we're not missing anything. If you have any uh, comments that you would like to be recorded as part of the official record, please contact City Staff. Janice Grant, Senior Planner, is the staff planner assigned to this file. You can email her at ggrant at cityofkingston.ca. And please indicate whether you would like your response uh, or whether you would like a response sorry, from the developer or consultants uh, so that your contact information may be passed along for said response. On the screen now are our guidelines for participation. These are part of the City of Kingston's public engagement framework. They are shared standards for any online engagement session. I'd just like to give everyone a second to review those as they will be guiding today's session. And finally, here's a rough agenda for today's session. Now, we are currently joined by, uh, it looks like 40 attendees for this session. Uh, so it is a larger consultant-led open house. We will begin uh, the presentation proper at 6.05. At around 6.30, we'll move into a Q&A. And after that, uh, we have an option for an additional comment period, at which point we will be aiming to conclude the session at 7 p.m. Having said that, the uh, consultants will be structuring the presentation and questions period based on the volume of questions to move for, recognize, move through, sorry, recognizing that there are a number of individuals that have attended the session. We want to make sure that we're getting to as many questions as possible. With that in mind, I'm going to pass things over to the consultants now. Hey, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Christian Peterson. I work with Podium Developments as one of the development leads. Um, so Podium has been active in Kingston for 17 odd years and are currently building along Princess Street. You may see uh, some of our projects underway at uh, 333 University, 495 Princess and at 575 Princess, which is Kingston's first large scale uh, Geo-Exchange residential project. Um, for tonight's open house, uh, we're glad we have such a strong turnout as we are here to, to listen to you and engage with you and get your feedback. We'd love to hear what you like and uh, what we can improve upon uh, or consider. Um, we've made one submission already to the city and have received their initial technical feedback. And so comments from tonight are, are welcome and will be considered for our resubmission package as we prepare for our uh, statutory public meeting. Uh, we've been looking at this site and the concept for over a year now and have been uh, 
are proud to be working along a very strong consulting team uh, led by Foten Planning and our architects and form architects. We also have our heritage consultant. They are in the audience as well, listening to, uh, to be receptive and, and hear your general comments and questions. So with that, we look forward to tonight and I will hand it over to Jennifer Wood, our planning consultant who will take us through everything. Great, thank you so much, Christian. Um, I'll just turn my video on here for a brief moment to say hello. Um, and thank you all very much for taking the time to be here this evening for this virtual open house. As Christian mentioned, my name is Jennifer Wood. I'm a planner with FOTEM Planning and Design. Um, so I, first I'll just start with a, I think a really brief overview, um, just building on Mark's introduction and agenda on how we see this format going. Um, so we're gonna start with a, a presentation. I'm gonna to try to be as efficient as I can um, and give not only an overview of the development plans themselves, but also a little bit of um, background in terms of how we got to where we are today with these plans. Um, and then the intent is to open it up for questions and comments. Um, we are sitting at about 40 attendees. So um, we do need to be cognizant of time here. So we'll probably try to limit questions and comments to one to two minutes uh, if you can. And we'll, we'll hopefully respond as best as we can tonight. And if not, we're, our team is taking lots of notes and um, we'll be happy to take them away and consider them further. And of course, by all means, uh, use the chat function as well if you're more comfortable posing questions or comments there. Um, so let's get started. Mark, if you could switch to the next slide, please. Um, so I think probably everyone here this evening knows where um, the subject property is located, but this image uh, outlines the site we're looking at in yellow and provides a little bit of um, locational context. So the site, which I'll refer to as 275 Queen Street, is right at the corner of Queen and Barry, um, but it also is a through lot and has frontage on Colburn Street. The site is centrally located um, within the core. It's uh, got good proximity to a number of services and amenities that the downtown has to offer, including good access to public transit. Um, the immediately adjacent uses include the Renaissance event venue um, that's immediately to the west, as well as uh, four townhouses that front onto Barry Street. The site currently contains a four-story office building right at the corner of Queen and Barry, um, but for the most part, the, the balance of the site is occupied by a surface parking lot. Um, given the you know, property's location, um, its underutilized nature, uh, an opportunity to infill and intensify this site was identified. Next slide, please. And I think we'll we'll go through the presentation uh, before kind of answering any questions or comments that are orally given or, or through the chat. Um, so one of the very first things that we do when considering the redevelopment of any property is to first consult the official plan, which is the document that sets out the city's land use planning goals and policies. The OP has a number of schedules or maps um, that provide layers that correspond to policies related to land use and development considerations. Um, so this slide provides an excerpt of, of three of the many OP schedules um, that exist, but these three in particular are critical to informing the redevelopment of 275 Queen Street. So the top is the um, basic land use schedule, which shows that the majority of the site is within the central business district designation. So that's the red area. And then a, a, a portion of the site towards the north, uh, closer to Colburn Street is in the residential designation. 
Um, within the central business district designation, um, there's a wide range of permitted uses, including commercial as well as higher and medium density residential development. And then if we look to the middle schedule, you'll see um, a large portion of the site is also located within what's called a detailed planning area. And more specifically, it's within the downtown and harbor special policy area. And within the downtown and, and harbor area, the OP envisions uh, an integrated range of uses, including commercial, hospitality, civic, community, um, open space and higher density residential uses, generally located above commercial uses, um, but potentially also within standalone higher density residential buildings. And we also made sure that we had regard for um, the established heritage areas, features and protected views, which are um, illustrated in the bottom image, um, which is the heritage schedule to the official plan. Um, and, and what that image shows is that 275 Queen Street is not located within a heritage conservation district. So these are, these are areas protected under the Ontario Heritage Act, such as Market Square, which you can see in red. Um, and it's also not within any of the character areas, heritage character areas. Um, which are identified in yellow, which aren't um, provincially designated and protected, but are identified by the city as, as having important heritage character. Um, as well, the site's not within any of the identified sight lines of protected heritage views. And so what we take from the OP, at least from a very high level, um, is that 275 Queen Street is removed from protected heritage districts and areas and is within a central location where appropriate intensification is envisioned. Next slide, please. So after we conduct um, an initial planning policy review uh, and look at the OP, it's important to look at and understand neighborhood context and character. Now, like I said, the property itself is not um, heritage designated or within a heritage conservation district or heritage character area as identified in the OP. There are a number of designated heritage buildings uh, in the area and in proximity, which are shown here um, in red relative to 275 Queen, which has been outlined in a, uh, a black line and you can see the existing building um, footprint and, and massing there. Um, and perhaps most notably is the Renaissance event venue, which is located immediately next door to the west. So, you know, given the redevelopment of this site has the potential to impact heritage properties that are in the vicinity, a heritage impact study was required and was conducted to really understand the heritage attributes of these nearby buildings and to inform the appropriate design of this building. Next slide, please. Um, so unlike Princess Street, Queen Street, it doesn't have a very cohesive or continuous streetscape. Um, Queen is characterized by a mix of land uses, um, different building heights, various architectural styles from different eras. And it also contains a number of, of underutilized or, or vacant sites um, with the streetscape sort of punctuated by a lot of surface parking lots. And the top image, well, both images really illustrate these missing teeth, if you will, in red blocking along the streetscape. Um, with significant gaps or missing teeth located on 275 Queen Street in particular, um, which we've outlined in a, a dashed blue line. And so we think Queen Street uh, and this property in particular presents a really exciting opportunity to fill in these missing teeth with well-designed mixed use developments. And the bottom image illustrates a proposed building footprint in solid blue. Um, that would fill in this missing tooth or underutilized site. 
Next slide, please. And as Kingston continues to work towards addressing sustainability and climate change goals, as well as Kingston's low vacancy rate, we're seeing an increase in the number of approved taller buildings throughout the downtown that will provide added density within the core. Um, and then, so this image highlights some of the approved and some existing taller buildings in the area, including um, a couple blocks to the west of the intersection of Princess Street and Division Street, which is permitted to be developed with a 20 story building. Um, as well as 16 story building exists just to the southwest, which is known as Princess Towers. Anna Lane is a nine story residential condominium at the corner of Bagot and Queen. Um, a nine story building is approved at 223 Princess Street, which is the capital condo development. And the Ontario Land Tribunal recently approved 19 and 23 story towers in the North Walk. And so when we look at the downtown more broadly, we're seeing a move towards densification through taller building construction. And we recognize this and do see the valuable role that taller buildings can play in adding density in the downtown, but also acknowledge that it's, it's critical and, and very important that we intensify in a way that ensures that the taller elements of these buildings are appropriately considered and set back and sized. Next slide, please. And so once we conducted a um, initial policy review, did a site and contextual analysis, we established some fundamental design objectives that would inform the preparation of plans for this site. And these include creating a pedestrian scaled and pedestrian oriented public realm, um, ensuring compatibility with the immediate and surrounding context, promoting and respecting existing heritage features and attributes, um, constructing a low carbon, high performance building to support sustainability goals, um, ensuring that taller elements of the building are appropriately uh, considered and set back and sized. And finally, designing a high quality and attractive building that will fit in with the downtown. So once we establish these overarching goals, we could begin to design and shape the building. Next slide, please. So the site is proposed to be redeveloped with a 16 story mixed use building. And while the maximum height of the building is proposed to be 16 stories, through step backs and through articulating the building, the height varies across the site from three stories up to the maximum 16 stories. And the building is generally, uh, it's broken down into a five story, story podium plus the tower above. So when we refer to the podium level, this is the lower built form base of the building. So this is the portion of the building that we experience as pedestrians and also as the immediate neighbors. Um, and when we refer to the tower, this is the more slender upper mass of the building that is set back from the podium base, creating separation from the street and the public realm, as well as um, provide separation from nearby sensitive land uses, such as heritage buildings and low rise residential development. Um, and a lot of thought and time and consideration has gone into the size and, and the location and also the shape of the tower on the podium base. And I wanna highlight some of these considerations, just starting, um, starting with Colburn Street. So, you know, I, I, I've been saying that, you know, this is a centrally located site on a, a major arterial road um, with opportunity for intensification, but it also fronts onto Colburn Street, um, which has a completely different um, character than Queen Street. Um, and we recognize that. And it's it's a really important differentiation. Um, and it was it was important that the building be designed in a way that maintains a lower height and massing as we move towards Colburn Street. And so the 
Uh, Tower has been significantly set back from Colburn, um, a minimum of 25 meters to help maintain that transition and, and the residential character to the north and, and also to help mitigate shadow impacts. Um, we've also used the setback of existing dwellings on the south side of Colburn Street as the benchmark for the proposed building setback along this street. So uh, this will help, you know, fill in that missing tooth um, and allow for that more continuous street wall, um, but it'll also allow for existing street trees to be maintained. The tower itself um, and its design was used as an opportunity to break up the massing into two parts, where the tower becomes an element that actually slides or staggers, uh, staggers into two elements. Um, and I think some of the renderings I'll show you in the moment better illustrates that, that um, staggered effect of the tower. Um, the uh, tower has been oriented more north-south and is stepped back with its uh, primary massing towards the intersection of Queen and Barry, um, again, away from uh, Colburn Street and lower density residential uses to the north. Um, there's also a generous tower setback at the uh, western elevation to respect the location of the heritage property located at 285 Queen Street. Next slide, please. Um, so detailed design in terms of like architectural treatment um, will be examined through a future site plan control process, but this team has begun thinking about um, and considering how the design and more detailed design and, and, and elements like the facade treatment uh, and materials and colors um, can assist with further breaking up the massing of the building, creating visual interest. And so um, here, again, you, you gain a bit better perspective of how the staggering of the tower and, and that shearing effect helps to break up its massing. So with the Eastern portion of the tower kind of falling into the background um, and away from Queen Street. Um, rather than uh, provide kind of standard enclosures for rooftop mechanical equipment, um, the mechanical penthouses uh, has been integrated into the building design. Um, and the penthouse level represents um, the 16th story. So there won't be additional mechanical penthouse or uh, mechanical equipment beyond that 16th level. Um, providing quality uh, private outdoor amenity space was also a key design consideration as we continue to need to find you know, respite during on and off lockdowns. So um, continuous balconies are provided along Queen Street above the podium level. And within the five story podium itself, the ground level and then the third floor will be clearly demarcated to further break down that massing of the podium and also help highlight uh, key entrances. Next slide, please. So this is a view um, of the Berry Street and Colburn Street frontages. It kind of captures both. Um, and here you can really see that building transition uh, to Colburn Street, which includes a front facade that is, like I said, set back in a way that's consistent with the established building setbacks along Colburn um, and provides a stepped back fourth and fifth floor to help complement that residential scale and feel. And again, provide that transition in height and massing towards Queen Street. Um, again, warm toned balconies will wrap the tower uh, on Barry and Colburn as well. Um, and then those units within the podium will have Juliet balconies. The entrance to the underground parking level and also the, the loading area will be accessed from Barry Street, um, which has been sort of pointed out and labeled here. Uh, and ultimately will be designed 
to integrate architecturally with, with the building along this facade. Next slide, please. Um, just some uh, a brief summary of some of the key development statistics. So as discussed, the building will range in height from three to 16 stories. It's proposed to contain 227 residential units, including studios, one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, there's ground floor commercial proposed, um, roughly 3,000 square feet uh, at grade. A total of 39 vehicle parking spaces are proposed in the underground garage. Um, each unit would also be provided with uh, one secure bicycle parking space internal to the building, um, plus an additional 12 spaces is proposed for a visitor and um, short-term bike parking needs. And common uh, exterior and interior amenity spaces are, are proposed um, in addition to balconies and portions of the rooftop amenity space are are, are intended to, where feasible, include uh, green roofs in order to make efficient and sustainable use of, of the, the, the areas that are provided by the tower step backs. Next slide, please. So as I noted earlier, providing a pedestrian oriented public realm was a key design objective. Um, so these images provide a preliminary landscape design and palette. Along Queen Street, um, as you may know, there is an existing high voltage hydro line. So the intent is to bury this infrastructure um, on 275 Queen Street in order to optimize public realm design. Now there are limitations uh, to plantings that can be accommodated based on burying this infrastructure, but there are also many opportunities to green and activate the streetscape um, using various shrubs and grasses. Um, the ground floor of Queen Street has been set back to accommodate different soft and hardscape elements, um, as well the corner of the ground floor um, at the, both the intersection and the, the west corner, southwest corner of the building have been rounded and set back to provide uh, at the intersection an, an opportunity for a pocket park at the corner that can be hardscaped and provide a bit of a forecourt to the commercial space. Um, based on the setback of the building from the west property line where it abuts the Renaissance, there's an opportunity for a linear courtyard that can provide outdoor amenity space, um, as well the courtyard provides a little bit of breathing room between the heritage structure and the new development while creating uh, a bit of a view corridor when you're traveling up Queen Street to uh, view and, and celebrate the stone masonry and the stained glass windows of the neighboring heritage resource. Um, and along Queen Street, there are two existing street trees uh, that are intended to be retained and the building has been set back uh, in order to accommodate for this. Next slide, please. So in order to facilitate this development, a zoning bylaw amendment is being proposed to rezone the property to a site specific C1 zone that would address uh, reliefs in setback from Queen Street. Um, one of the side yard setbacks, height and angular plane, density, off street parking, and the dimensions of the bicycle parking spaces in, inside. Now, the exact reliefs being sought are outlined in detail in the planning justification report that was submitted with the applications. Um, we're trying to keep this, this meeting as an opportunity to look at kind of high level. Uh, plans and design considerations. If there are specific questions around the, the zoning bylaw amendment, we'd of course be happy to, to discuss those uh, either tonight or, or in the future and provide clarifications on, on what those reliefs look like. Next slide, please. So I, I know the agenda had us till 6.30, so um, it looks like we're, we're doing okay time-wise. Um, I appreciate that was a lot of information in not a lot of time, but we wanted to make sure we 
left as much time as possible to hear from you because that's the purpose of this evening. Um, so it looks like we've got 45 attendees um, and I see there's already a few questions popping up in the chat, which we'll make sure to address. So I'm thinking at this point, um, we can open it up. And I just wanted to um, emphasize that we really do want to hear from you, whether that's this evening through comments that you provide orally or through the chat. Um, if you think of more comments or have feedback for us, please don't hesitate to submit those comments or, or any questions that you have in writing, um, either directly to this project team. So the first email that you see there, 275queen at podiumdevelopments.com, or of course, through Janice Grant, the planner at the city who's assigned to this file. Um, we want to know what you like, what you think works, um, what are aspects of the project that we could improve upon. Um, and the earlier that we can receive this feedback, the better position that we'll be in to take that back for review and consideration for our next submission. So um, we do look forward to hearing from you. And um, with that, I think, Mark, do we want to open it up for, I think we'll, we'll start with questions um, was the thinking, and then we can circle back at the end if people have any, any comments uh, or any final thoughts that they want to provide. And let's please try and limit it to, I'm gonna say probably two minutes just based on the number of people. And, and again, we're happy to stay past seven till, till 7.30 if, if we need to hear from more people. And uh, just uh, going to jump in here with a quick facilitation comment. Uh, just a reminder to please share your questions using the Q&A tool of the chat. Uh, in the Q&A tool, all questions are listed out. If you leave it in the chat, we will be monitoring, but there's a chance we can miss it. So we want to make sure we're getting to all of your questions. Thanks. I'll pass it back over to the uh, consultants now. Jen, should we start uh, in the Q&A box? Yeah, just trying to... Find that. <laughs> oh, Q&A. Okay. So we will start from the top and, and if people want to submit oral questions or comments, by all means, um, feel free to raise your virtual hand and we'll circle back with you as well. Um, so I'm just starting from the, the top as it appears in the uh, Q&A. Um, could you please explain the overhang of the building? How does it relate to the sidewalk and the required setbacks? So I'm just gonna maybe refer to my slides so we can provide a helpful visual because I think a visual is the is going to be the best way to illustrate this. Um, I think probably slide 16 if if Mark you'd be so kind as to move to that slide. So there is um oh back one I think yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the one, thank you. So there is a, um, the ground floor is set back from the Queen Street property line by, I think it's 1.5 meters, um, so that we can provide a little bit bigger of a, a public realm on Queen Street, um, allow for sidewalk as well as some landscaping and hardscaping and a little bit of breathing room for entry and exit into both the commercial use as well as the residential entrance. And then the, the second floor, uh, second, third, fourth and, fourth and fifth. So the rest of the podium level above that um, actually cantilevers slightly over that first floor to provide some um, sort of pedestrian shelter. So at grade, there is a 1.5 meter setback. And then the upper levels of just the podium do cantilever uh, slightly over that 
uh, ground floor setback. Um, and thank you, thank you, uh, Vicki, for that that question. Um, I'm moving to the next one now as it shows up. Um, how does this how does this development affect traffic in the area and on street parking? So um, as part of, of any development proposal of this scale, a transportation impact study is, is required to be submitted uh, by a traffic consultant, which looks at um, what are the existing traffic movements and how are existing intersections operating? Then they forecast um, new trips that would be generated based on how many units and parking spaces and people are expected in the development. And then it kind of compounds those, those two together and projects into the future um, and essentially tries to determine whether the development will uh, create increased traffic to the point where intersections and the road network are no longer operating at an acceptable level. Um, we are proposing a pretty reduced uh, parking rate, um, so there would be 39 underground parking spaces, which at peak times would not generate, uh, would generate a negligible amount of additional traffic. The traffic di study didn't recommend any uh, major network improvement requirements. It did acknowledge some existing challenges on Queen Street, particularly as you get closer to Division Street, and suggested that some um, uh, signal timing adjustments could be made to improve that. Um, but that, uh, you know, the increase in traffic from, from this development can be supported by the existing traffic network. Um, Part of this question also relates to, to parking and on-street parking. So um, this development is intended to accommodate all its parking on site, and that is certainly a requirement of the city. Um, and that reduced parking ratio is, is also supported through that, that parking study. Um, and the intent here is that, you know, hopefully through the walkability of the community, access to transit, that the majority of, of those living in and visiting this site will not be 100% solely dependent on private private vehicle um, on this site. Um, Susan Phillips, what is the, sorry, what is the height bylaw for this site? So the zoning that applies to the site currently is one of the C1 zones um, in the downtown and harbor zoning bylaw and it currently permits a maximum height of three stories or up to a maximum of 12.75 meters. Thank you for your question. Uh, from David, a question for the presenter about the site was a redevelopment of the existing building, a possibility repurposing and adding to the existing building, if not why and where is that proposal? Um, and, and certainly, uh, Christian, feel free to weigh into the, I guess, more the practical uh, redevelopment considerations of, of a building of that age. I think from a, an efficiency standpoint, maintaining that building and building around it would not be the most efficient use of redeveloping this site. So, you know, I guess the short answer is, is no, we didn't look at maintaining that existing building rather um, kind of starting from scratch and you know, designing a site that would most efficiently use the uh, lot fabric and envelope that we have to work with. Yeah, it's a bit of an, uh, a challenging site to use that existing structure. Uh, it's not ideal as an office that's got relatively small floor plates and it's a bit of an aging structure. Uh, it is owned by part of the current ownership structure and has been currently tented out as a commercial office in the interim. Thanks, Christian. And, and just building on that, um, it is an existing commercial office building. Um, there are portions of the downtown area that the planning policy requires to have ground floor commercial, and there are portions that do not require to have ground floor commercial. And this, this property, based on its location, is actually not required to have 
commercial uses on the ground floor. Um, but we do recognize that longstanding employment use on this site and want to make sure that, you know, this development can still support, you know, a mixed use and, and vibrant Queen Street. So despite that, we do still want to maintain commercial use in this building on the ground floor, even though it's, it's not required. Um, thank you for, for that question. Um, Etienne, would be the proposed shaded plaza a public space or accessible only for the occupants? Thanks. Um, so there are, there are actually a couple, um, you know, amenity plaza spaces to this development. There is a small, what we're calling pocket park right at the corner of Queen and Barry Street. Um, that would is proposed to be uh, a public space. Um, it would function sort of as like a public private space because it would um, spill out from the proposed commercial use, but it is intended to be fully public. Perhaps we could uh, switch views to get that sort of viewpoint for everyone. Oh yeah. Um, a good that's a good suggestion um maybe if you flip to the next slide actually mark that might be kind of helpful um maybe the next one actually oh I think we're going the wrong direction. Um, so I'll, I'll just maybe continue and we'll stop you if we, find, we see the right one. Um, thanks, Mark. So that corner pocket park. Um, that one. Oh, that one's a good one, yeah. So you can see right at the corner, um, based on how that first floor has been pulled back, as well, we've got this kind of interesting contemporary rounding of both corners. So what we have close to the intersection is an opportunity for a public space. I suspect maybe what you're inquiring about is the courtyard on the west side next to the Renaissance, um, which would be, yeah, like a landscape shaded courtyard. At this point, it's proposed to be private amenity space that would, you know, be associated with the residential development. Um, if there's, you know, an interest in this being a publicly accessible space, that's really helpful for us to know and, and potentially work with the city on that piece or potentially even, you know, working with or partnering with the Renaissance to, to create a bit of a um, shared space there as well. I think there are a lot of opportunities for that linear courtyard, and we're very open to suggestions um, from folks on, on how they see that space. Thank you, Etienne. Um, Sorry, Jennifer, I do see that there's a raised hand uh, from Greg. Uh, just okay. in the interest of approaching all questions kind of chronologically, do you mind if we switch over to raised hands for a second? For sure, please. Uh, okay. and. Greg, you've been invited to unmute yourself. You can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so mine, our question just, it, we were talking about parking. Um, so I used to live on Colburn Street, very close to 275 uh, Queen Street and uh, street parking and an overflow of parking was always kind of an issue there. So when we're looking at the, the ratio for units to uh, parking spots, it comes out to 0 0.17. Um, and I understand if there's a lot of student houses, uh, if there's a lot of students living there, they may need less parking, but you know, there will be visitors and whatnot. Um, what's being done to consider the parking situation or possible like overflow uh, of parking there just because the amount of parking spots is so low? That's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. So, you know, as you know, we are proposing a ratio of 0.17 spaces per unit, which results in 39 spaces. So, and that's, you know, based on a uh, number of spaces per residential unit, which is how the zoning bylaw 
requires parking. In the downtown area, um, parking is not required for commercial use because the hope is people can just park downtown and, and walk to commercial uses. But I think maybe what we need to look at more closely with our traffic consultant is, is what that breakdown of 39 spaces looks like. So, you know, you know, in our, you know, in our mind, the hope is that this reduced parking ratio will help kind of support the city's policies and efforts, you know, regarding sustainability and combating the climate emergency by shifting the focus away from private car ownership. And that's, that's the idea for those living in this building, recognizing though that people are also going to be visiting and needing that short-term parking. So I think, you know, hearing that concern and commentary on Colburn Street, um, we'll need to look at that more closely and how we um, provide appropriate uh, resident parking, visitor parking, um, increasingly short-term parking for, for example, Amazon drop-offs and Uber Eats deliveries and, and how we manage all that. So I think that's an ongoing kind of conversation and what we're looking at um, and hope to provide you with some more feedback in the future. Certainly on Colburn, we're, we're avoiding any vehicular access to the development. It'll all be off Barry Street. Um, so maintaining, um, we'll actually, I guess, technically add some on-street parking on Colburn because that existing entrance to the parking lot will would go away. I don't think there are any more hands up in the in the participants list. We can go back to the the written. Jen, you're on mute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay. Correct. Right. Yep. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, how will the project mitigate high wind velocity and funneling surrounding this development, commonly a problem with taller buildings? And is something that in Kingston we're, you know, beginning to kind of understand and look at through new developments because taller buildings are relatively new. Um, a pedestrian wind study was uh, submitted with this application. Um, you know, I can't say I'm an expert in the matter. It is a technical exercise that has been reviewed and looked at um, from the appropriate experts and professionals in that field. There is a study um, available, um, which you can access through, through DASH with the city. Um, if there are any particular comments or questions regarding that work and that study, please send them our way. Um, you know, broadly speaking, the building is designed in, in of a scale um, and is situated such that there aren't concerns with affecting kind of microclimates based on, on the building, but there is a technical study that, that was done that looked at that specifically. So thank you very much for that question. How will this development contribute to increasing affordable housing? Um, yeah, great question. Um, and one that obviously is top of mind, I think, for everyone these days. Um, well, one, it'll it'll add 277 units to the housing stock in downtown Kingston. Um, there's going to be a wide range of unit types. So there are a combination of studio units one bedroom units, two bedroom units, and there's also some three bedroom units as well. Um, so hopefully with that kind of unit mix um, and providing some of those smaller unit sizes, um, there'll be an opportunity to, to have more attainable lower price points in some of those, those smaller units. Um, but I think simply getting additional stock um, available, especially in the downtown will help to play a role in the broader affordable housing issue that you know Kingston has been experiencing for a while um, and that a lot of communities are experiencing. 
um, I guess to be more explicit in responding, there aren't any units, at least at this point, that are proposed to be um, uh, affordable housing units, such as uh, subsidized units um, through the municipality or other programs. These would be available on the market, um, but hopefully at a, a variety of price points, just based on the um, range of unit types and, and sizes. So thank you. Um, and Mark, feel free to jump in if there are raised hands. Um, yep, we do have uh, one more, but I think we can go through a few more typed Q and A's before switching over again. Okay. Um, okay, noise from elevated amenity space will not be buffered from neighbors like noise at grade would be by the built environment. Um, what perimeter noise mitigation will be installed around the sixth and 16th floor exterior amenity spaces? Um, so I, I think uh, we're not quite at that point in terms of designing what those spaces will look like. Um, we'll get there. So we're, we're at the zoning stage where we're looking at sort of, um, this is the, the, the height in the built form and the density that we're proposing. Um, we will get to the stage further along when we're at more detailed design where we'll look at um, exactly those types of considerations. Um, and what we will be required to provide um, at the site plan control stage is a uh, detailed noise study, which will look at potential noise impacts of this development on surrounding sensitive uses. So that through that process, there'll be recommendations for potential acoustic fencing, um, not only for amenity spaces, um, but also for you know, equipment that might be on those rooftops that might cause impacts. Um, but I think that comment is duly noted and um, you know, we can work with the developers as, as we move forward to um, you know, as we get further along, incorporate potential, um, you know, hours associated with those spaces um, that sort of tenants or residents would be signing up for when they when they move in. So appreciate that concern. Thank you. Okay, so. So moving on to the next one, Varsity Realty Inc. defines itself as a purpose-built Canadian student housing real estate company. Is the target resident of this development Queen's students? Um, the short answer, answer that or is coming to... from Christian. <laughs> Go ahead, Christian. <laughs> uh, the short answer is a uh, target is a, a multifamily uh, residential building, so no specific user type market as student focused. Okay, um, how are we for time? 6.55, so we're, we're good to keep going till, till 7.30, just putting that out there. So if you all are seeing the five minute uh, mark coming up, um, please don't worry. Um, what parking needs would typically be anticipated for the number of units being proposed for residents and visitors? So, so we have the zoning bylaw, is what outlines the parking requirements for any given use. Um, so the, this site is within, well, currently we're consolidating the zoning bylaw as we speak, but it's in the downtown and harbor area zoning bylaw. Um, for commercial uses, as I mentioned, there isn't a parking requirement for the downtown. Um, and the zoning bylaw requires one parking space per residential unit. It doesn't um, differentiate a requirement for residents versus visitors. Um, is there a certainty that 39 parking spots will be sufficient? I would be concerned that the local previously established parking needs would be crowded out by new residents. So it's it's a it's a great question, and it's um, you know whenever we seek 
variances or relief in parking requirements, um, we're undertaking study that a study that uh, attempts to project the parking needs of the development based on a number of factors. So in this case, um, a site specific or a project specific traffic and parking study was completed that considers um, the particular aspects of this location and this development and considers things like, you know, what is the walkability of the neighborhood? What is the um, quality of access to active modes of transportation, such as cycling um, and transit? Um, how close are we to employment and um, commercial uses? Um, a number of factors that, that are considered, as well as the, the unit breakdown and anticipated uh, tenant base. So a number of factors are, are considering considered when trying to project the parking needs. Um, you know, and, and Christian can certainly speak to this probably better, is, is that Podium is, has been in Kingston for a long time and is finding that especially in, in the more central areas, um, a one space per unit ratio is an extreme oversupply of parking compared to what the actual uptake is. Um, so, you know, the 39 parking spaces is a ratio that's kind of consistent with the levels of uptake that this developer is seeing at um, similar and actually often less central locations. Um, and, you know, the developer also wants to have a marketable, marketable building where people want to live. And they're finding that people who want to live in their developments are um, choosing to uh, not have, or many of them are choosing to not have um, personal vehicles on a regular basis. So it's a bit of a combination of, of looking at, you know, projecting the expected requirements through the study and, and also just, um, you know, having done a number of developments in the city and, and understanding those, those uptakes of parking. Um, okay. What about the overhang on Berry Street side? The overhang looks like more than 1.5 meters on the right-hand side in the drawing. Just wondering which plan would be, we've also got some floor plans as well. Level one. So the overhang on Berry Street, which you can actually um, see best, I think, in this image, is really only extends uh, closer to the intersection. The majority of the cantilevered overhang that we're looking at is focused on, on Queen Street. Um, so really, we just have that overhang on Berry Street where it kind of comes to um, uh, a connection or intersects at the building near the intersection. So essentially, it's 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 for the most part flush on Berry Street. I've lost my Q and A. Sorry, one second. Q and A. We just want to clarify the uh, setback of the public realm on Barry there, Jen. The setback of the public realm on Barry. So on Barry Street, there's a proposed uh, zero meter setback with no cantilever over that. Um, so why should the property not be developed at six stories and not with reduced setbacks as intended in the official plan? So certainly I can um, speak a little bit to official plan policy and how it directs, you know, more high density residential development in the downtown. I think certainly 
economic factors do play, um, you know, being realistic, do play a role in the feasibility of developing a six-story uh, building on the site that, you know, Christian might be in a better position to speak to. But the official plan um, contains policies that address higher density residential developments in the downtown. The OP doesn't specify a maximum permitted height. So it doesn't say, you know, six stories is, is what we want to see uh, in the downtown. It essentially says that higher density residential uses are permitted um, either above commercial or potentially as standalone residential buildings where ground floor commercial isn't required. Um, and any high density proposals need to demonstrate compatibility and meet uh, the locational criteria as set out in the official plan. So, you know, the official plan is, is quite, um, is not very prescriptive when it comes to height in the downtown. Like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't define a, a particular specific maximum height. Instead, what it says is, if you want to propose higher density, which, you know, broadly we agree or the official plan acknowledges is can be appropriate in the downtown because we want to intensify where we, we have services and amenities and concentrate people, but it needs to be demonstrated to be compatible through a site-specific urban design study. And that's, that's what the official plan outlines essentially. So instead of prescribing specific heights in certain locations, um, additional height can be considered um, and evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis through an urban design study. I think six stories would be, you know, challenging, if not impossible to be feasible uh, in this location um, and would probably stay maintained as a four-story office building and a surface parking lot. Um, is, you know, to answer your, your question specifically around why not six stories. Um, how has the building been designed to reduce bird kill, a common and well-documented problem with tall buildings, birds killed as a result of striking tall build windows? Um, Chris, do you want to respond? Yeah, this is something that gets studied more during the site plan phase um, and somewhat from a municipal design standard or sort of reflecting upon other experiences, but um, can be done through fenestration treatment, can be done through materiality. Um, that's typically how it's treated uh, with respect to bird friendly glazing. Thanks, Christian. I can take the next. I can take the next one as well, which is mm -hmm. target target market. Sort of asked uh, that one already is multifamily, um, and it's still uh, open at the moment. If it would be um, either purpose built rental or a condominium project, it's still quite early. Thanks, Christian. Um, will the traffic and transportation studies account for cycling and the need for active transportation infrastructure to support the existing and new cyclists? Will cyclists be protected at the major intersections between the development and the nearby key sites like the hospital and universities? Will community benefit uh, or funding derived from density bonusing be committed to active transportation projects such as those already underway in the um, active transportation plan. So yeah, thank you for that question and comment. And I think there's a broader discussion here around active transportation infrastructure in the downtown and providing that connectivity. Um, certainly we wanna do everything that we can on site to promote cycling and active transportation. Um, so a big part of that will be a dedicated um, bike storage room on the ground floor um, that will have secure parking for every single unit. Um, other aspects that we can look at that are increasingly popular in, in new developments are things like um, 
bike repair rooms and facilities like that. So certainly um, through the design of this building, we'll, we'll do everything that we can to uh, encourage and, and promote cycling and active transportation. And I think um, through community benefits, that could be a, a great idea for what that contribute, could contribute to beyond the site, which is cycling infrastructure. So thank you, Megan. Okay. Um, the four row houses on Barry. Uh, uh, graphically demonstrate the incompatibility of scale of this proposed development in relation to the surrounding residential area. Why does the development surround and hover over them? Will residents of those houses be able to remain in their dwellings during construction? Um, well, certainly, yes, during construction, there is no um, suggested or proposed or need for any kind of relocation of, of those residents of those buildings and the developer will, you know, actively work with, with, with those residents to ensure, you know, as minimal disruption as possible during the construction phase. Um, you know, the actual design of, of the site and the building itself, um, this question around the Barry Street townhouses was a really, a significant consideration when we were locating uh, and sizing the tower. Um, so what we wanted to make sure was that where 275 Queen Street or, or the subject property backs onto the rear yards of those existing townhouses on Barry, that the height would not overwhelm those rear yards. Mind you, um, those properties have a rear yard, uh, rear lane, um, but not really much of a, a rear amenity yard. Um, that being said, you know, providing an appropriate transition in height backing onto those properties. So because of this in the north half of the property, and I'm wondering there's probably a better, if you flip to maybe the next slide, uh, Mark, um, there you go. Um, making sure that where this site backs onto those Berry Street townhouses, that the height is maintained um, at a maximum of five stories and that we're ensuring that that tower is pulled back and does not back onto those townhouses. So um, there are about two stories in height. So there's, there's certainly a height transition and a, a gentle densification up to the five stories as they back onto the Berry Street townhouses. And then the, the, you know, the mass of the tower itself would not be located behind those Berry Street townhouses. Um, and then where 275 Queen or, or this, this development site uh, is next to the side yard of that southmost townhouse, there is an at grade setback, so it's not right at the property line um, because there are windows on that side of the building. And then beyond that, the tower is further stepped back um, from that property line and from those, from those townhouses. There has been no mention of the heritage impact statement that has been done. Can you provide comment on the general conclusions of that report? Um, so as I noted before, yes, a heritage impact study was prepared. Uh, this site is not itself a designated heritage property or building. Um, and it's not really located in a heritage conservation district or heritage character area, um, but there are a number of uh, heritage designated properties and buildings that are in proximity of this site, including next door at Renaissance, also across the street on Queen Street and also across the street on Barry Street at the corner. Um, and HIS was, not only prepared in support of this development, but the heritage consultants were actually 
involved from the very beginning of the design of this building. So it was very much a kind of an, an iterative process of having heritage consultants, urban designers, planners, and architects at the table to um, essentially push and pull on this building and design it to consider some of those adjacent heritage properties, especially the Renaissance or 285 Queen located to the west. Um, and the recommendations of the her heritage consultant really informed the design as we went. Um, you know, I will note that um, staff have indicated that there is a peer review going to be required of the heritage impact study, um, which has yet to be undertaken. Um, so at this point, uh, we'll await the peer review and um, that along with the recommendations of the HIS, um, as well as any feedback that we receive from uh, heritage staff would inform um, you know, our response and, and any um, comments that we received for that, through that peer review process. Shall we go to, uh, I think there's one hand up still in the uh, participants list. Sure, uh, Leah, I've uh, gone ahead and invited you to unmute yourself. Feel free to go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Christian, it's to you just for clarification. Um, Varsity Realty is a student housing company. Um, do you expect us to believe that this is this is for multi um, a multi-family dwelling? That is currently what it's being designed as. Uh, Varsity Realty is, uh, is is a partner in, in terms of owner of the project. Doesn't necessarily reflect the actual end user uh, target market. And as well, the I would say the the proposed unit mix is, is geared much more towards um, families, multifamily than it would it be. There are no large, uh, nothing larger than a three bedroom. That's all for raised hands at this point, Jennifer. You can go back to the Q&A. Thanks, Mark. Um, will the uh, commercial retail spaces in your development be used to fill in the current gaps in amenities in downtown, example, a hardware store, so that residents of your development will be more apt to leave their cars at home? Um, well, I think, yeah. I mean, Great question. The exact uh, tenants at this point and users have yet to be identified for this space. Um, the uses that would be permitted are the uses within that downtown zoning, which is an extremely broad uh, range of commercial uses that could be permitted in this space. Um, it's roughly 3,000 square feet. So, um, you know, there are opportunities to provide for a somewhat larger scale retail use, like a small local hardware store, or it could potentially be um, more smaller retail spaces. But certainly I think having ground floor commercial on this site will provide opportunities for not only residents of this building, but also nearby residents to have additional commercial space to be able to walk to, um, services and amenities to walk to. Um, we note that while the, sorry, it's all moving up. Uh, we know that while the Renaissance building was mentioned several times, the 1907 church building on Colburn was unmentioned. Uh, the church currently occupying the building, uh, next church is a vibrant community living and involved in the local community. As a member of the community, I can say that I appreciate the need for greater housing density downtown, and we are pleased to see that the range of different size units in the building, however, the building will be overshadowed by the planned tower for quite a few hours each day. A number of renters use the building as well as more, uh, many more directly church-related events. 
The reduced light may well affect several activities at this building. Please explain how the light issues are addressed by the current plan. Thank you. And there's a, a few aspects to that, that question and comment. So thank you. Um, so, you know, when we refer to the Renaissance building, I think uh, a big consideration there is the, you know, the heritage um, designation and significance there that that was examined through the heritage impact study and, and some of our design considerations. Um, next church is, um, you know, along with the other lower density, uh, more sensitive uses along Colburn Street, primarily residential, but also uh, this, you know, valued community use was also considered through uh, the built form design. So again, um, ensuring that that tower separation was substantial from the Colburn Street frontage and providing that transition to address concerns like uh, overlook, um, potential shadow impacts. Um, as part of the uh, urban design study that was prepared and submitted, there is a shadow study, um, which you may be referring to um, when you refer to shadow impacts. Um, there are uh, some impacts, for the most part, the tower is going to be impacting the lower levels of this proposed building on um, the portions that are closer to Colburn Street. Um, and if you look at the, the shadow study, and certainly we can we can even take this conversation offline to look at it in more detail and how it impacts the church. For the most part, the shadow impacts from the um, tower itself would not project that far north uh, onto, onto next church. So I'm um, happy to um, follow up and, and look at that shadow more closely, if you, shadow study more closely, or if you have any questions about it, I'm happy to connect offline as well. Hi Jennifer, I just want to step in here and uh, just remind everyone that we're getting closer to 7.30, which would be closer to our hard cutoff for the session. So we have about 10 minutes of questions left, uh, recognizing that there are already 15 in the Q&A. Yeah, thank you for the... So we, I'm not sure if we want to see if there's uh, questions that haven't been asked yet. Mm -hmm. And once again, just a reminder for all attendees, all the questions that have been asked in the Q&A are logged and they will be passed along. Um, and if you do have any additional questions, we can drop the emails in the chat. Sorry, back to you, Jennifer and Christian. Um, thank you. And uh, that's a good point, Christian. I think if there are some duplicate questions or similar questions, um, we will not linger on those. There was another question around uh, affordability and, and certainly we acknowledge that that continues to be a concern for folks um, and have seen that that comment here as well from an anonymous attendee. Um, so thank you for those those comments and concerns. Um, on page 43 of your planning report, you show shadow study why is the winter section section shaded out. Um, mainly because during the winter solstice, there are significant shadows in general because the sun is so low in the sky. So when you compare it to, for example, the fall and spring equinox, and of course the summer solstice, it's significantly darker in general. And that modeling is intended to reflect, you know, and compare um, that level of shadow and darkness compared to the other times of year when the shadow is modeled. Have you designed waste removal to minimize impact on the surrounding neighbors, noise, odor, visuals? Um, so all uh, waste will be stored interior to the building. There is a refuse room um, that will be next to the loading facilities. So trucks would be able to, garbage trucks would be able to come directly into the loading bay and collect refuse, refuse uh, garbage recycling interior to the building to minimize impacts on, on neighboring uses. Thank you for that question. Um, Jennifer just mentioned that she would be working with the developers. Can you please explain? I thought you were working for them. Yes, so 
Foten is retained by the developer and we're working for them and with them to develop uh, a plan for this site. It's a very collaborative exercise. Um, I live and work very nearby and I'm concerned about ambient noise for neighbors, for example, coming from the proposed loading area fronting onto Berry Street is located adjacent to existing dwellings. How will the loading area be designed to limit the potential for impact in terms of noise and visual intrusion uh, on these adjacent spaces? Is there any opportunity to accommodate loading underground? And what about other noise during construction and operation? Um, certainly this is something that we can look at in more detail. It will be a fully enclosed internal loading area um, that would likely have operable closing doors. So meaning that trucks, whether they be garbage, uh, loading for the commercial use, or even just, you know, residents moving in and out would be able to come in, um, close those doors and maintain noise interior to the building. Um, but that's something, you know, further along at the detailed design stage that we'll look at more closely in order to, to mitigate those noise concerns. Yeah, in terms of uh, construction and operations, I'll, I'll be done within the construction uh, noise limit bylaw and the other construction site requirements. Uh, and again, loading is internal to the building. Um, is there any plan for charging stations for electrical vehicles in the 39 parking spaces? Thank you. Yeah, so each spot will be roughed in for electrical charging and a certain amount will be uh, provided with electrical charging stations. It lends itself to support our proposed parking supply as well as dealing with traffic demand and also looking forward towards um, overall reduction in, in the carbon intensity of the site. It's being designed as a proposed zero carbon building um, under the CAGBC. So such initiatives go up to sort support that overall uh, design and certification approach. Thanks, Christian. Why is Varsity Property submitting an application that knowingly violates the city's official plan of 10 story maximum buildings in the downtown? Um, so the, the zoning bylaw does include a maximum height permission, um, but the official plan does not uh, prescribe a specific height maximum in the downtown. Um, it does in other areas of the city. For example, Williamsville does have official plan policy that restricts uh, height by number of stories. Uh, whereas in the downtown, there isn't a, a maximum height permission in the official plan. Rather, it needs to be looked at through site-specific urban design studies for its appropriateness and through a zoning bylaw amendment application. To, to clarify, it is not varsity properties as the as the applicant the applicant uh, is being done by podium developments on behalf of the owners. Just there's a different difference there. Yeah, thanks for clarifying, Christian. Um, from Megan, I live and work nearby, and I'm concerned about. Oh, I read that one. Sorry. Uh, when will the plan be available for the integration of the existing? housing stock on Barry Street and the proposed building. From what was visible on the screen is the uh, in the architect's drawing, there was clearly no integration at all. Might the frontage of the existing buildings be included in the plan? Uh, when are workers cottages of a type that uh, has a similar uh, familiar feel having a long history in the neighborhood? Um, so we can certainly make these plans of available um, that illustrate the interface and integration of the proposed building with the Barry Street towns. I'd be happy to make these plans available. I hope that answers, answers the, the question. So we can work with staff to get, get this up to, on Dash so it's accessible. Um, from David, most European cities of this size of city would never wish to build a 12 story building close to their downtown center. They repurpose their existing buildings 
which includes promotes both human scale and diverse mix of affordable housing. Why can we not, as your study suggests, not utilize the vacant lots both at this location and the blockbuster location and develop low rise buildings there, but spread out the buildings at lower density and uh, heights, I think. Uh, why does the city of Kingston promote skyscraper type buildings that use more building resources and material that costs more money to develop? Um, Might be more of a planning uh, regime question. Um, yeah, yeah, it's certainly, I think, a, a broader intensification, very interesting question and, and commentary that, you know, we can't necessarily address on, on a site-specific basis, but uh, thank you for that, that commentary, David. Um, Gary, sorry, I'm confused about setbacks from the sidewalks. On Queen Street, one diagram shows three meter setback. Is this from the sidewalk or from the street? But I think you mentioned 1.5 meters. Please clarify on Barry Street, you mentioned no setback, but the sidewalk shows the building slightly set back from the residential properties. Again, please clarify. So thank you. And I know sometimes the plans can be difficult to interpret. Um, and so there are a number of building setbacks depending on what floor we're looking at. So on Queen Street, the ground floor setback is 1.5 meters. The second through fifth floors uh, of the building then come closer to, to Queen Street um, and uh, kind of cantilever over that 1.5 meter setback. Um, below grade the, oh, thank you uh, for flipping to this plan. So this is the ground, this is the ground floor plan. So you can see on Queen Street, there's that kind of white strip between the dashed property line, dashed black, property line and the front of the building. So that's that, that setback I was referring to at grade. Um, and then on, on uh, uh, Barry Street, that setback is reduced to zero meters. And then if we flip through additional floor plans, we can see um, the podium then cantilevers over that first floor. And then beyond that, we then have further step backs of the tower. Um, and on Queen Street, the setback of the tower, it ranges because of that staggered uh, effect that I was talking about, anywhere from three meters up to uh, almost six meters. Uh, there certainly is uh, area within the municipal right of way between the property line and the actual uh, paved circus of Berry Street um, that would include sidewalk and, and boulevard. So that might be some of the area that you're referring to where it looks like there is some room between the building and the street. And there is, and, and this is area within the actual municipal right of way that provides further separation of the building from Barry Street. Um, according to the developer, the OP does not specify height limit, but the bylaw does. I may have missed it, but can you explain again what the existing height limit is? Yes, certainly. So the existing height limit is set out in the zoning bylaw, which permits a maximum height of three stories, uh, not to exceed 12.75 meters. This is in the zoning bylaw. We're proposing to amend the zoning bylaw um, for increased height, um, uh, which requires an analysis of the official plan, which does not prescribe a maximum height here. Um, we have one more, I know we're at 7.30, but maybe I'll just try and tackle this last question if that's okay. Have you considered building something like the beautiful and more appropriately sized buildings in the corner of Wellington and Brock? Um, I think that's a comment we can take away as yeah. uh, a reference per perhaps to, uh, to go and take a look at that. So thank you. Yeah, and maybe in follow-up, you can specify which corner, we can look at that more closely. So thank you. Okay, seeing no additional questions, um, we can go ahead and get to wrap things up if that's all right, uh, Christian and Jennifer. So um, once again, thank you for attending this evening's consultant-led open house. So you can rewatch 
this session on the city's YouTube channel. And again, this entire recording or live stream switches over to a recording. Uh, you can also um, uh, follow along for project updates. I don't know that that should necessarily say um, sign up. There are two emails in the chat right now. Um, one, the Podium Developments email, if you'd like to reach out to the project team there. You can also send any comments that you'd like to be part of the city's record to, again, ggrant at cityofkingston.ca. That's Janice Grant, senior planner on the file. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to once again thank you for attending and have a great evening.